Greetings to you from the Cherokee County Master Gardeners. I'm this year's president of the group. Uh, we meet in Jacksonville. Uh, last time I spoke in this room was five or six years ago, and it's a pleasure to be back. Um, usually when I talk, I show a picture of my family. Uh, you guys are lucky because my family is here. And uh, yeah, we've got seven children. We did just get back from a trip. We went and we saw eight national parks over the course of two and a half weeks and uh, just had a blast. We finally saw the desert, first time in my life. Uh, that we actually got to see the desert and we said where's the desert because there are so many plants and I always had this idea in my mind that the desert was just a barren landscape with nothing growing but I was shocked that it was just plants everywhere and we loved the desert um, I was surprised by how much I really loved Utah in particular uh, if you ever get a chance to go I, I recommend it um, this is uh, this is Jacob uh, back when he was about 18 months uh, our people are gardeners uh, they're born gardeners um, or if they're not born gardeners, they become one pretty quick. They don't have a choice in our house. Um, this is John with his uh, daylilies. He's been hybridizing daylilies these days. Uh, if you go to texasdaylilies.com, you can see his catalog. He, uh, he sells daylilies. He has, I don't know, how many do you have, John? 200 different varieties, maybe? Uh, pretty close to that. It's a big number. Uh, of course, this is what John usually looks like, because he's got his camera out everywhere we go. Uh, we went down to SFA uh, for a, uh, some sort of a field day, and... This is all you can, any picture you try to capture of John, he's doing this. Um, it's uh, Lydia out in uh, Capitol Reef National Park. They have an orchard in the bottom land uh, at this uh, national park in Utah in the middle of the desert. And the river, the Fremont River, runs right through this bottom. And they've got a whole system of irrigation that doesn't use electricity. It's a, a ram pump that brings the water up out of the creek and then it flows through the entire bottom land. And they have 2,500 fruit trees. And so in the middle of the desert, uh, here's this massive orchard, and you can just walk right up and eat as much apples as you want, uh, and pears, and they've got peaches, just amazing uh, place. So as I mentioned, uh, we live in Jacksonville. Just go out here to 79, turn right, go about 25 miles, and that's where we live. Um, we live uh, actually kind of closer to New Summerfield, really, so we're kind of neighbors with y'all. We live on 90 acres. Uh, my dad's a pilot. Uh, as you can see, we do a lot of big field gardening. We have a lot of raised beds. We keep chickens, we keep pigs, we keep cows, we keep um, cows that we milk and cows that we eat. And we, we slaughter our own meat. Uh, we process it all at our house and uh, generally try not to buy anything from the grocery store except for pizza and ice cream, uh, <laughs> sometimes tortillas. Uh, this is Abigail uh, kind of tending to our, our tomatoes. Boy, we had a bumper crop this year. We grow, we, we garden these 10 by 10 square foot beds. We've got eight of them, or no, we've got 10 of them right now and we keep on expanding. We do really well. If you've ever been to the um, Jacksonville Tomato Fest, uh, which we do every June in Jacksonville, we have the Homegrown Tomato Contest, and I'm proud to say that we pretty much sweep it every year. Uh, disappointing opponents since we moved here in 2007. But um, if, if, uh, you know, if you all know anybody in Cherokee County who grows tomatoes, tell them to enter into our contest. because um, Anyway, as mentioned, I do run All Things Plants. Um, you all maybe have heard of Dave's Garden. Uh, that's a long, long, long time ago I started that site, sold it. Um, it's pretty much been out of my hands longer than it was in my hands. So if you go to Dave's Garden now, that's not really the site that I made. Uh, they've kind of changed it around so much. All Things Plants is basically my new evolution of gardening websites online. Three times bigger than Dave's Garden. Um, we're basically destroying the competition and having a lot of fun. Um, my wife and I do a weekly podcast. Uh, where we talk about gardening, especially in East Texas. Um, it's a lot of fun. We have a database of plants. Uh, every plant you can think of, uh, every plant in cultivation, is uh, in our database, usually with pictures and information, and people are talking about it and stuff. So really good gardening website. It's kind of like Facebook, but dedicated to gardening, specifically. So we also have a weekly newsletter that goes out. So if you join that, set the, uh, you know, subscribe to the newsletter, you'll get it every Saturday morning. So anyway, um, let's talk about soil. What I want to do, usually when I'm invited to speak, uh, I, I usually end up, I have this one talk where it's called um, Gardening Innovations, and I kind of just go all over the map talking about all these different things. Uh, in this case, I'm going to talk about just one thing, which is soil, and that might be kind of hard for me because I'm not used to focusing in on one specific thing. I, I kind of like to be all over the map. Um, but we're going to try it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of talk about what soil... Um, you know, what's in your soil, how to improve your soil, especially here in East Texas. We've got bad soil here. I'm just going to be honest. Um, it's a sandy soil or it's hard red clay soil. Uh, it's pretty rare to find something that's nice in the in-between. Very low on organic matter. Uh, the pH is usually acidic. 
So it's really hard to garden. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so you all know about macronutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Uh, the secondary ones, especially uh, particularly calcium and magnesium, I'm going to talk about those. And the micronutrients, I'm just going to mention that they exist, uh, you know, iron and all those things. Generally, when you're, when you're adding fertility to your soil, the main things that you're worried about are these macronutrients. And so I'll be talking about how to get those and, and how to identify when you're missing them. Um, but let's talk about nitrogen for just a second, though, because I found this to be fascinating. Right here on the left is the molecule of the human blood uh, hemoglobin. And on the right is the plant chlorophyll molecule. And they're absolutely identical. The only difference is at the center is magnesium, and at the center of the human uh, hemoglobin is iron, of course, which is where you get that red, <coughs> the red color of blood. Uh, I think that that's fascinating. Um, you'll notice here on the plant chlorophyll, you've got four parts nitrogen uh, surrounding this magnesium uh, atom. So that's, as you can see, nitrogen is really important for growing the chlorophyll, which is important for your leaves. Um, it's absolutely just one of the most important things you can get. Um, growing legumes provides nitrogen for your soil. I don't know if you all know about that, but legumes do the, the whole nitrogen fixing thing, uh, which is very awesome. Lightning makes nitrogen, which I'm sure most people are already aware of. That's why after a big lightning storm, your pastures finally turn green. Uh, I'm ready for some of that myself. Phosphorus. Look, if you ever see, if you ever see purple around the edges of your leaves, generally that means a phosphorus uh, deficiency. Um, it's important for a lot of things, uh, especially DNA. Um, bone meal, wood ashes, gives you more phosphorus. Um, generally around here, we don't usually get phosphorus deficiency so easily. Potassium, yellow on the, on the edges of your leaves. Uh, and that would be a potassium deficiency. I'm just going to keep on going. Calcium, a lot of people are interested to know this. Um, you know, they say Jacksonville was the tomato capital of the world for a long time. And the, the situation is, it's kind of hard to grow tomatoes in Jacksonville unless you're kind of careful with your soils because a calcium deficiency is generally what causes the blossom end rot. You all ever have a tomato where at the end where the blossom was and it turns black and it just rots and you're like, man, what's happening to my fruit? Well, that's a calcium deficiency. By the time the tomato is about the size of a dime, it's already received all the calcium from the plant that it's ever going to get. And so as the, plant gets, as the fruit gets bigger, it's using up its calcium to make that strong, thick wall. But once it gets to be so big, it finally just runs out of calcium. Now the, uh, the end starts to rot. Um, so a lot of times the case is that, it's, it's that you, you, you maybe you have plenty of calcium in your soil, but for various reasons, the plant can't take it up. In fact, that's usually the case. Um, it's it's uh, generally adding calcium is not going to really fix your problem. Low water, too much water can interfere with the plant's ability to uptake the calcium. Um, pH plays a major role in calcium uptake. So if you're dealing if you're dealing with blossom end rot, if you've got it, it's already too late to fix it for that season. Um, sorry to say that. But uh, for next season, you do want to correct it, not by adding calcium, but more about, you know, doing the other things. And we'll talk about those other things in a minute. Magnesium. Uh, am I still on? Yeah. Um, magnesium. Again, magnesium is not talked about very much, but it's at the very center of that chlorophyll molecule that I was talking about. And uh, without that, you're going to have problems. If you ever see a plant that's got these dark green veins in the leaves, and then the rest of the leaf is light green, that's, that's usually a magnesium deficiency. Pretty interesting. Uh, there's going to be a test on this, by the way. <laughs> Y'all ever gotten a, um, a uh, soil test, and it tells you that there's, you know, here's what your CEC number is, the cation exchange, and you're like, man, I, I don't know what that is. I mean, Y'all ever seen that? Yeah. This is what it is, and this is fascinating to me. So the deal is this. Um, an ion is a molecule that has an electrical charge, and it's just exactly like a magnet. If you think about it, like a magnet have a, a plus and a minus. And if they try to stick together, you can, you can attach the plus side to the minus side of a magnet. And if you try to flip it around, and if you try to attach a minus to a minus, you know, the, the magnets will literally repel each other away from each other. Well, that happens in soil as well. And the soil has a charge, usually, and the uh, nutrients in your soil also have a charge. And the question is, are those charges compatible with each other? So a cation is the positively charged, I think, yes. Anion is negatively charged. And so most of your, um, most of your elements, they occur as these uh, cations. Now, so if your soil has a negative charge, 
then as the nutrients enter into your soil, they have a positive charge and they actually bond to your soil and they hold on tight until the plant needs it. And then the plant releases these little enzymes that break apart the nutrients from the soil and make it available to the plant. But if your soil has the same charge as your nutrients, like sand, then as soon as the rain comes, the nutrients are not being held in any way and it just falls right through the soil and washes out down into the creek. And that's why the sandy soil is so hard to garden in uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't hold on to those nutrients. It just lets them go right through. Um, so, a little too far. So, um, yeah, sand is bad for that very reason. Now, one of the nice things about sand is that it drains really easily. Now, clay, on the other hand, with its tiny little particles, is more on the, um, the uh, you know, the, the negative side. So, that's why clay is a lot easier to garden in than sand. So, anyway, try to mix up the two. Uh, if you've got really sandy soil, add a lot of compost. Compost is, you know, has the right CEC numbers that you want. Uh, vermiculite is particularly good, but it's kind of expensive. So, anyway, now you all know about the CEC number, if you didn't know before. Um, pH, again, um, pH is one of those difficult things. Uh, a lot of people don't even think about it. I generally don't think about it, although I have a big pile of lime and I will use it sometimes. But I'm going to just show you this graph here. So here's your pH uh, from 4.0, which is strongly acidic, up here to 10, which is strongly alkaline. And here's the various uh, nutrients that you might need for your garden. Notice how here, like at pH uh, 5.0, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, it's only getting about half as much to the plants as they need. So really, right here, starting at about 6 and ending at about 8, uh, anywhere inside there, your plants are getting all the nitrogen that they need. Potassium, no matter how alkaline your soil is, your plants will have no trouble getting the, the uh, potassium that it needs. So you see that for us here in East Texas with our acidic soil, potassium is a problem. Phosphorus, again, interesting. Look at this. It's fine up until 7.5, but then from 7.5 till 8.5, your plants have a harder time getting the phosphorus. And then when your pH goes above 8.5, now it's back to normal again. Just interesting. But again, everything is having a hard time on the acidic side. And this is why people add lime to their soil, brings the pH up here closer to the 7 range where all of your plants get what they want. Another interesting thing, um, not on this list, is aluminum. And aluminum is kind of the opposite of this. So the more basic your soil is, it's kind of like the opposite of, of what you see right here. The more basic or the more alkaline your soil is, the less the aluminum can be taken up. The aluminum is bad for plants, and especially for plants like alfalfa. So this is why out west, where they have really high alkaline soil, they can grow alfalfa really, really well because the aluminum doesn't get taken up by the plant. Here in East Texas, our soil is so acidic, this is like the opposite of potassium, uh, down here in the acidic, all that aluminum is being taken up by the alfalfa and it's killing the plant. And this is the reason why we don't grow alfalfa in East Texas. Much to my dismay, because I'd love to grow alfalfa. So that's pH. Um, yeah, so what do we do? I, I suggest definitely a soil test. Um, soil test especially tells you about your CEC number. I like to know that. I like to know what my CEC number is so that I can know if I'm leaching my nutrients. I mean, you work so hard to get your nutrients into the soil, and if you're just going to lose it every time it rains, you're just, you know, you're losing, you're, you're, you're fighting a losing battle. We have an orchard that's out in a sandy spot of our, of our property, and no matter what we do, it's just we just keep struggling with those trees uh, because the soil is just pure sand. So um, the soil test really does help with the CEC number, and it also tells you what your pH is, which is really helpful. Um, leaves, I mean, adding any kind of organic matter you can to your soil is really the key to success in East Texas. You know, leaves, grass clippings, um, I don't know, coffee grounds, compost, spoiled hay, even animal bones. I mentioned that we process our own animals. Well, we actually take the bones from even cows and bury them in our garden. And uh, of course, then three years later, you, you sink the shovel in and you hit something. You say, what is this? Or sometimes animals then come in and dig up the bones out of our garden. Uh, it happens. Um, and consider not rototilling. Um, I'm not going to really go into the whole rototilling thing. If you, if you really want that, come to my permaculture class that I teach in um, Rusk, uh, which is, you know, Rusk, south of Jacksonville. Uh, I, it's a three-hour class I do every March for the Master Gardeners, and uh, it's sort of like an introduction to permaculture, and we talk a great deal about tilling. 
and why rototilling is a bad idea and what it does to your soil and how it's a bad thing. Uh, it's really like, I talked for like, I talked for about an hour about the rototilling. I'm not gonna do that today. Um, but I will talk about sheet mulching. Um, this is an interesting thing that also came out of the permaculture idea. Y'all may have heard of lasagna gardening. Um, it's the same kind of idea. In fact, I think that lasagna gardening, I think they stole the idea from the permaculture people and just renamed it with a more marketing friendly term. Uh, like lasagna gardening. But the idea is this, if you're going to make a new bed, what you do is you put down layers of cardboard. I'm going to show you this again. Okay, so you cut the grass down as, as far down as you can. Maybe amend the soil just a little bit with some blood meal and bone meal and things like that if you think you need it. Uh, if you want to lime at that point, that's the time to do it. Cover it with cardboard and get as much cardboard as you can. And don't be afraid to put down a, you know, really thick, heavy layers of cardboard overlapping each other so there's no empty spots between them. Just cover the whole ground with the cardboard, and then on top of that, you can just start adding on layers of various things. Manure, grass clippings, hay, compost, mulch, uh, whatever you've got. The important thing is to have it in layers. And you end up with this, you know, this bed that's about 12 inches deep, but within six months, it's kind of compressed down, and you end up with about four to six inches of soil, and it's a really nice garden. Um, so this is one that we did. These beds that you can see right here are, um, we had done that, we put down the cardboard, then just layers of various things, and at the top we did the compost and, and, uh, and soil mixture. And then we mulched that all with this old hay. I've got a neighbor who I won't tell you his name because I don't want you to go talk to him yourself, but he's, he's got these huge round bales of hay that he always has left over from the season. These are old, gray, just trash bales that he can't feed to his cattle, and he's always happy to just bring them by our house and just drop them off next to our driveway. So uh, we use a lot of that old hay for mulch, and it's excellent. Um, so we did, we set up these gardens, I think it was in the fall of 2013, and, you know, there it is uh, about the spring of 2014. So this is six months after we made these beds. Uh, no fertilizing. We didn't fertilize these beds at all. Never have. We've never, we've never laid down any fertilizer into these beds. Uh, just whatever they get from the soil and whatever we get from the organic matter that we're adding to them. Um, pretty good. This is my herb spiral over here. Uh, it's a, it's a, wooden, it's a, a brick structure. I, I, I do a whole talk about the herb spiral. Um, but it's a, 20, it's, a, it's a six foot wide structure in the shape of a spiral made out of brick. And if you, were to, if you could uncoil it, it would be 25 feet long. So you end up with a 25 foot long garden row inside of a six foot circle. And it's awesome. We grow herbs. Uh, we've got oregano, rosemary. Actually, we have like wow, 20 different herb varieties growing in there. And it is great. Prominently situated right outside of our door. So anytime we need herbs, we just go outside straight to the herb spiral. But anyway, I have a whole talk about that. It's just awesome. Um, don't show this picture to Don Stover of SFA. Uh, we were down there at... Um, Jasper, Texas, and she went first and I followed her and she was talking about how people like to grow these gardens that are just full of plants and you just can't even tell what, what you're looking at because they're so full. And, and she was condemning the practice and I was thinking to myself, uh-oh, because I knew that this slide was coming up. But uh, to me, this is beautiful because there's just plants everywhere. There's no weeds. None, every plant that you see here was purposely put there. And uh, we're just kind of crazy like that. But here's daylilies, irises, salvias. I got tomatoes growing back there. There's some peppers in here. Sage, of course. I got a rose right here. There's a clematis growing up on that big tutor. Uh, it just goes on and on. And actually, this photo was taken uh, last summer, and it looks even worse this year. Uh, John has taken over this whole side bed right here, which is 100 feet long, and he's got all of his daylilies in that bed. Um, so, we, yeah, we're pretty crazy when it comes to gardening. But to me, this is beautiful. Uh, Don thinks it's chaos, and, but, you know, everybody is entitled to their own opinions. <laughs> Here's a kind of an uh, aerial view that I took with my, probably with my drone. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, but the point is that this whole thing was made with sheet mulching. Uh, the, you can see that we added a border, uh, which kind of helps keep the beds where the beds are and keeps the walkway where the walkway is. Um, Never fertilized anything. We've never added any fertility to this soil other than, you know, compost and manure, um, things like that. So, love that garden. Um, I want to talk about hugaculture. Um, well, I'm doing good on time. I could just slow down. I should have brought, I should have brought my, uh, my herb spiral presentation. Anyway, um, hugaculture. Um, hugaculture is just, y'all ever heard of hugaculture? Who's heard of it? 
Anybody has heard of it? No? Okay, all right, four, four or five people. That's six people. Thank you, Katie. Um, Hugo culture is sort of like an extension of sheet mulching. So in sheet mulching, I'm talking about all these different layers that you're putting down. You've got cardboard on the ground, and then comes uh, you know, compost and wood chips and straw and more compost and garden soil and things. Well, with Hugo culture, you're basically adding wood as that first layer. So you can put down cardboard, and then you put down just logs of wood. See, this is one use for sweet gum. People say sweet gum is such a trash tree, I hate sweet gum, it's not worth anything. You can't, you can't burn it for firewood, you can't make anything out of it. And that's generally true, although you can make some things out of it. But um, it, it is an excellent hookah culture material because it rots so fast. And especially when it's under the soil, where it stays more moist for longer, it'll be rotten within a year. And uh, the river birch is kind of the same way. So our bottom land has a lot of birch that we're frequently having to clear out because you know the things grow so close together they get so tall and they start to crowd each other. We can go in there and thin out river birch and we can thin out the sweet gum, bring it up, cut it up into firewood sized logs like this, and then lay them out on, uh, on the ground. And boom, we've got the start of a new sheet mulched bed, which of course during the first year, it's gonna take a little while for that soil to break down. So you gotta be careful of what kinds of things you try to grow during that first year. But after that, you're in good shape. And what we did here with this, um, with this, uh, with this particular area, my house is kind of down here on this bottom left right here, and this is where actually my office is. And if I step out my door, this is a pathway that goes down to the barn where we keep our milk cows, we milk them in the barn and things like that. So this is a very frequent back and forth walking that we do. So this is also a hillside as you can see. So what we did is I made myself a, a A-frame level that I won't describe how I made that, but I actually made these, these things are level with the ground as it goes down the hill. So then I dug these little ditches, laid down, the, um, laid down the wood, and then covered up the wood with a sheet mulch system. You can kind of see an idea here. You can kind of see it's not a big ditch that I dug, but that's a pretty good size. And then I've got these, these um, well, they're kind of like berms now to the south of that ditch. Wood, and you can see I've got leaves and grass clippings and just junk that I brought up from the woods. Compost that I got from the Natchez facility. Um, add in soil and other things like that. Just kept on layering up as much as I could. Well, now notice this. When it rains, it fills up these ditches. And since, since they're on a perfect level with the, uh, with the hillside, it's just like a little tiny pond. And instead of the water just rushing on down the hill and none of that soil is infiltrating in, it's actually slowing the water down. Uh, and then now the water has a chance to slowly penetrate into the ground. Uh, so very awesome. In the summertime, when everything else is kind of dry, the soil underneath of these hugel culture mounds are generally kind of moist still because of that, because of the, the water has had a chance to infiltrate in. And if you do this on a really, really large scale, and there are people, uh, especially in Australia, out in the desert and the bush, who are doing this on the scale of, we're talking like 100 acres, they actually make a measurable impact on the groundwater supplies in their region by doing this. Uh, so pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, that's the same exact bed right here. So here's, here's before, here's after. And we're talking about four months difference here. So I made these beds in January. This picture was taken, I think, in, um, in, in uh, April. Uh, those are tomato, uh, onions. The root crops grow really well when you want to start this on, you know, the first time you do it. Uh, potatoes grow particularly well in a brand new hugo culture bed. Uh, of course, onions do really well. Um, that's a gourd. Some people say that, well, it's, tr it's true that as the wood rots, it actually takes nitrogen, and it uses the nitrogen to decay the wood. And so a lot of people will say, well, the, um, you can't grow good greens on a hugo culture bed because all the nitrogen is being taken up. Uh, it, well, tell that to this gourd who, he, he doesn't know anything about any nitrogen deficiencies. And this is in year one. But I think that this is part of the benefits of the sweet gum is it's, it's rotting so quickly that it's not, you know, as soon as it starts to rot, I think it kind of starts to turn around and release that nitrogen back into the soil again. Um, doing very well. Uh, peppers and um, basil uh, with, what is that, blackberries. Um, just a, a gr great, as you can see, these plants are doing really well. The peppers are just getting close to being ready for harvesting. Um, so that's hookah culture. All right. If I had sound effects, I would play the stabbing violin right now. You know, the scary, dun, dun, dun. Can I talk about earthworms? Anybody in here keep earthworms? No? One, two, okay, good. Three, okay, I see three. Uh, 
Yeah, I mentioned that we raise all these animals, and one of the animals I didn't mention was earthworms, and I love earthworms. And I'm going to talk you all into this. This is awesome. One of our All Things Plants members did this. Uh, he took some soil and measured it out to where 10% of the soil was um, the uh, castings. That's the manure that the earthworms produce. And then, of course, 90% was the potting soil. On the left are the uh, seedlings that were amended with the vermicompost. On the right was just the regular soil with nothing added. So pretty impressive. Uh, there's lots and lots of pages on the internet that you can read about people promoting what vermicompost can do for you. But there's no question in my mind that vermicompost is the number one fertility addition that you can make to your garden uh, by far. And it's, there's so many benefits to it. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. Let's see. Um, yeah, banana peels, apple cores, coffee grinds, tea bags, uh, almost everything that you produce in your kitchen can be converted back into this extremely powerful compost. The only thing you really don't want to do is things like grains and bread and milk and meat, stuff like that. Generally, if you wouldn't put it in your compost pile outside, you don't want to put it in your worm bins either. But if you, if you think it's good for compost, then it's good for your worm bins. Basically, if it's plant material, minus grain. Um, compost tea, I want to talk about this. Um, the, as the compost is being made, and I'll, I'll, I have a picture of this later that I'll show you, uh, the stuff is constantly dripping the, um, this black liquid out of the bins. And that black liquid is basically pure concentrated vermicompost tea. And then what you can do is you can capture that black liquid, mix it up about like one part the uh, compost tea to you know, like nine or ten parts water. And then you end up with a fertilizer that you can water your plants exactly like you would do like miracle Grow. Uh, but much, much better, and the microbial life is really good. Uh, it's just wonderful. Um, so, it doesn't burn your plants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're going to do worm bin composting, you can't use any kind of worms. You can't just go out to your garden and dig up worms and bring them in. Although, some people have had success using night crawlers. Um, I don't suggest that. There's this one called Icenia fetida. fetida. Uh, it's a, um, it's a, called a red wiggler. You can order them online. What is it, like about $20 a pound, I think. Usually, my children are selling worms. I mean, how many worm bins have you all sold to have worms? I mean, 25 different bins. Uh, yeah, usually, sometimes you can find people locally. What they do is they take these five-gallon buckets, and they make them into a bin, complete with all the bedding and everything, but it's kind of like just a get-started thing. They'll put about a pound of worms in and then sell them at the Master Gardener plant sale in, in Jacksonville. Um, they're not in that business right now. But um, anyway, you can also order them online. And they will mail you a bag of worms. And that's how we originally got started six or seven years ago. Uh, a bag of worms came in the mail. And <laughs> we dropped it in the bin and we were done. And we now have about one trillion worms uh, spread across a billion bins. Um, do they fall out while you're looking there? Do they fall out? Fall out. Yeah, isn't that creepy? Um, yeah. they, they, they can. They can. And I'll, and I'll show you some strategies on how to deal with that right now. Um, this is the basic bin that we use. Um, this is not one of those really deep bins like you see. Uh, you know, you go to Walmart and you buy that deep bin for your, uh, for your lights, for the um, Christmas lights and things like that. This is not that. This is, a, this is the shallow 10-gallon, uh, what's it called, the rubberneck tote. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about? It's only about 12 inches. It's about 12 inches uh, deep. You don't want to use a really deep one because if you use that, as the worms are making their compost, it'll just compress it down, and then there's just so much material that at the bottom of that bin, you're going to start to get these anaerobic conditions, and that's just not good for anything. Uh, it basically turns it into the opposite of what you want, just a, a poison for your plants. So you want it to be kind of shallow. So find these little shallow bins. They sell these at Walmart. What I've got right here is I've got one that I made where I drilled some holes up in the top here for some airflow, but there's no holes on the bottom, and then I kind of put a uh, frame on. Some people will just put bricks down in there and the idea is that then you take another one of these and put it inside the first one. And then that way the top one can drain down into the second one. So when you get worms that try to creepy crawl their way out of your bin, they would kind of go into this one below it, if you get my meaning. But we also use lids and the lids generally keep them in and also holds the moisture. So anyway, um, I actually have a bin that was sitting on top of this. I took it off to take the picture. You can kind of see that black liquid that I was talking about. It's already starting to fall down into the bin. This is another benefit of having a, uh, a bottom to your bin, is you get to capture this black stuff. 
occasionally pour it off into a container and use it. Awesome stuff. Something else you can do is mix it up with water, run it with a little bubbler, like an aquarium type bubbler, with maybe a little bit of um, molasses, and you'll get an explosion of that growth of the good bacteria, and then you can water your plants with that or spray it on your leaves. And we've had some great success with like a foliar spray using that stuff. You have a, you have a question. Is that frame underneath the ferrule? Is that frame underneath this wood frame? I'm trying to get the perspective of what you're seeing here. This thing right here? Okay, okay, yeah. I wish that I had this. I should have just brought it with me. I don't know why I, I didn't do that. Okay, this wood frame right here is there so that when you put the other bin in it, it has something to keep it up off of the bottom, okay? But I can't just make it float in this thing. So I added a wood piece on the outside here and a wood piece on the outside here. And then I've screwed through, all the way through. So it's kind of pinching it onto the side. That's interesting. Yeah. You know what, though? Honestly, these days what I do is I just put a couple bricks. I put a brick right here and a brick right there. And then I just put my bin right on top of the bricks. Works just as well. This is, yeah, you always, you always start with really complex, then you move towards simplicity. So this is the actual bin. This is where the real magic occurs. Um, so again, Little holes drilled. People say worms can fall through those holes. They generally don't. They, they kind of, if they try to get to that hole and they want to go through, they kind of see the air and they say, oh, I'm not going to do that. And they'll turn around and go back into the bin. Actually, very rarely do we get worms trying to escape because they're happy. Why would they escape? There's nowhere, there's nowhere better for them than inside this bin and they know it. So they generally stay where they are. So take the bin. Uh, once again, remember now, the picture doesn't the picture kind of makes it look like it's one of the deep ones. It's not a deep one. It's the 10-gallon shallow one that's about uh, 10 inches deep. Uh, okay, pre-soak the cardboard because cardboard is the number one thing that you're going to put in your worm bins. And what we used to do is we would get like a, a, a box cutter and we would sit on the floor and we would just cut the boxes into strips and then the children would all help and we'd all be you know, kind of tearing them up and it would just take forever and then after 10 minutes I would look up and I'm the only one in the room because everybody had slowly disappeared to go other places because it was such a terrible chore. Um, we figured it out though, uh, pre-soak the cardboard, uh, soak it in water, give it like, we're talking two or three days in the water. And when you pull that stuff out, I mean, it just tears right up. I mean, it's so easy to tear it like that. And also, if you've got tape and things like that that are, that are stuck to the cardboard, well, don't worry about taking that tape off beforehand. Just soak it in the water and then once you pull up out of the water, the tape just comes right off. You just chuck the tape behind you into the trash can. Um, and you want some cow plops. You know, everybody's got a cow pasture. So go out to the cow pasture, get some plops. Not, not new ones. Get some old ones. I think every time I say the word plop, I get a laugh. Get some sand, um, sand, clay soil. Basically, you know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to replicate the conditions of the forest floor. If you go out to the forest and pull that soil back and just kind of look at what's in there, that's kind of what the earthworm's like. So, you're, so you want some garden soil, uh, forest litter for sure if you've got a forest nearby. Just go out there and just grab a handful. Uh, tiny bits of mulch. I love this. Uh, go out to the garden where you've, where you've recently maybe mulched your beds. Pull the new mulch away and on the bottom you'll see some of that old mulch that's kind of half rotten. Excellent for worm bins, seriously. Um, so start putting it down. You know, put down a layer of cardboard and then some of your stuff from the forest and then more cardboard and then more stuff from the forest and some of the plops and things like that. Again, it's kind of like making a sheet mulch bed, really. Um, another layer. The, the main point is you don't want to just dump everything in in big clumps. You want to layer them up and keep going. I mean, you'd think at some point it's ridiculous how much these bins can hold because it feels like you start with a wheelbarrow full of cardboard plus all the other stuff and somehow it all ends up in this little tiny bin but it's true so you need a lot of material uh, especially the cardboard it's so you just couldn't believe how much cardboard you can put in one of these bins keep going you're not done yet all right finally finished uh, and once you get all this stuff up it's all layered up really nicely take the take the worms that you've bought or that you obtain from a friend and just drop them right on top of the bin and then put the lid on. We made a lid. Well, here's the lid that came with the uh, container that we bought. Drilled little tiny holes in that lid 
And when you place it on, of course, then you still get the nice airflow, but it, man, it makes a huge difference. Keeps it dark in there. Worms love the darkness. Uh, keeps them from escaping as easily. Um, it's just a good thing all the way around. If you're using, and you can see, by the way, that you can stack these things up. Uh, this is a total of four bins. This gray one is one of the deeper ones. And we, this was the one that where we learned not to use the deep ones because the gray one just got so deep, so thick. The, the, when we got to the bottom of the compost, it was just nasty and gross. And we said that was a mistake. So we, never, we don't use the gray one anymore. Um, it, we also have um, a, uh, a feed trough, you know, those galvanized uh, feed uh, tubs, like the, the watering troughs. We actually have one of those that kind of rusted through just enough that it wasn't able to carry water anymore. And so what we did was we drilled a few holes in the bottom of it and filled it up with material just like this. Uh, not to the top because that would be too deep, but uh, that worked out as a great bin. And we covered it with just a sheet of plywood. We've also made these out of 55-gallon drums where we actually just cut the whole, we, we laid on its side, cut the side out, and fill that up. That's worked out really well for us. Um, this thing kind of goes two at a time sometimes. Okay, um, now how do you feed them? And this is where a lot of people get into trouble is they, they'll say, I've got flies that are in my bin. You're admitting, yes. Na what? Five minutes, okay. Uh, that's perfect then. Um, you're not admitting anything. <laughs> um, people say I get gnats, or I've got white flies, or I've got other bad things that are floating around my house now, and what do I do? Well, the answer to that is the reason why you have those is because when you were adding your stuff from the kitchen, you weren't covering it up. So if you've got app, you know, apple cores and banana peels and whatever else, the idea is you open up the bin, pull that cardboard and the bedding to the side, and then put your refuse in the little hole that you just made and then cover it back up again and make sure that it is completely covered up. And if that's the case, you will not get fruit flies, you will not get gnats, you'll not get anything. Just make sure that on the surface of that you can only ever see the cardboard and the bedding and stuff. Uh, the worms will find their, quickly find their way to it. Uh, strange bacteria starts to break the food down and then the worms actually eat the bacteria. That's the way it works. Um, really interesting. Kitchen scraps are good. I mentioned no meat, no dairy, and no bread no wheat, you know, things like that. Um, I would actually avoid the strong things. I actually have a line for this. Things like onions and garlic, I would, I would avoid it. Um, if you can imagine the worms wouldn't like it, you know, that's because they're so strong and garlicky and stuff. So harvesting, here's the way, that, here's the way to harvest it. Because you, you got this big bin, they've converted all the cardboard and all the stuff into this black soil, which is wonderful and delicious and it's just great for your plants. But when you try to use it, you realize that you, you scoop it out and you end up scooping out a thousand worms along with your scoop of compost and you don't want to just use that with the worms in. So the idea is, this is what we do. Take the bin outside on a nice sunny day and take the lid off and the worms are gonna, you know, the worms, they hate the sun. So they're gonna drill down about an inch into the soil. So then you scrape away the top inch of the soil just kind of scrape away until you start to see worms again and then stop scraping. The worms will then go down another inch or two. You can scrape away, then they continue to go down, you scrape away. And it, the process is kind of like you just go out there every 10 minutes to do this, so it doesn't take very long. And by the time you get sort of to the bottom of the bin, all the worms are down there in the bottom and you've already harvested most of the vermicompost. And uh, then at that point, make a new bin, new cardboard, new bedding like I described, and then, um, uh, and then uh, just dump what's left from that first bin right on top of the new bin and the worms find their way down and you're off to the races. And these things multiply like you wouldn't believe. Um, so compost tea, I mentioned that already. Um, love the compost tea, especially when you do the aeration with the, uh, with, with the, um, the bubbler, with the aquarium, you gotta do it. I mean, you gotta try it. And when you do the, when you do the, uh, the spray, on the foliage, especially early in the morning when the stomata is just opening up so that the, um, the moisture can enter into the plant. So that's when it's taking in these nutrients directly through the leaves. Um, we've had some pretty awesome results doing the foliar sprays. Um, anyway, that's it for my soil. Uh, I do encourage you all to visit All Things Plants. It's kind of cool that the largest gardening site online is based right here in East Texas. Um, sign up for our weekly newsletter. And the notes for all of my programs are on my website. So like, if you want to download the PDFs, and kind of look at some of the things. Like I've got a whole article about hugel culture where I really, really geek out about the whole thing and it's a long article. Uh, you can see all that stuff by just going to allthingsplants.com slash lectures. Allthingsplants.com slash lectures. And uh, you'll see like everything, all my secret stuff. That's my secret stash. So, yes, question? How do you spell that hugel culture? 
how do you spell the hugel culture? H-U-G-E-L K-U-L T-U-R. It's a German word. It means hill culture. Hugel means a hill. The guy Sepp, Sepp Holzer did that. Yes, ma'am. You keep saying verma. Yes. What? I kept saying verma composting or vermiculture. Verma means worms. So vermiculture means worm culture, worm raising. Yeah, vermicompost means worm compost. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ah, okay, so the cardboard, can the cardboard have color? Uh, you know what, I like to just use the brown cardboard. I don't like, like, you know, we have these diaper boxes that have the shiny glossy on the outside. I never know what that's made of, and it's probably safe. It's probably soy ink or something like that, but I'm just, don't, I don't like it, so. so like Not newspaper, no, because see, the deal with newspaper is this, and I've done this. I've used newspaper in a sheet mulching bed. A year later, I go back and I, op- I, I kind of peel the layers back. I can still read the date on the newspaper. It's ridiculous because it's just it's a hard time breaking down. And I think it's because it just kind of mats down, can't get any airflow, can't get any moisture through, and so it just kind of preserves it, like it mummifies it in place. It's terrible. Cardboard, on the other hand, is corrugated. The water can flow right through, and it breaks down really super fast. Uh, any of these recycling centers usually have cardboard. You can just show up and get as much as you want. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you said you could put old hay on top of it and use it as mulch. Do you not have grass that spreads out of that? Okay, uh, so I use hay as mulch, and do I not have grass that spreads out of that? Uh, not really, and I've heard other people talk about that, and I've heard people say, well, if you're going to use hay, you got to look out because of the, the hay is going to sprout all of these weeds. It doesn't happen to us. I mean, I don't know. Trish maybe can explain why. I mean, it, it, this doesn't come up. The only thing that we really deal with with the hay is there's, there's two issues. You've got to know where the hay is coming from. And if people have um, used herbicides on their pasture, and a lot of people use grazon, which can stay in there for a long, long time, and it's not good. Uh, so you've got to be aware of that. Our hay comes from a guy who doesn't spray anything. And that's why it's full of weeds, which is fine with me. Um, but the other thing, I think that if you've kind of got a really thick layer of mulch, it's hard for the seeds of anything to germinate. So generally, anything that's growing in there, we put it there ourselves. The other issue, though, is if you use too much of the grass or too much of the hay, it can actually be like a haystack. Where, you know, a properly designed haystack, the water just kind of goes right off. It doesn't penetrate into the haystack. Hay is actually a pretty good shedder of water. So if you've got too much of a hay pile on top of your garden, when you water it, somehow the water just slicks off and doesn't get really get into the ground. So we don't use too much. Generally, we try to use wood chips for, hay, for, for mulch as much as we can. Or we'll do some hay, and then the final coating will be wood chips, which a lot of these pallet factories give you their wood chips for free. Yes, ma'am? Can you use pine straw? Pine straw? Definitely, yeah. They say that pine straw will make your soil more acidic, mm-hmm. and maybe that's true. Oak leaves do the exact same thing. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not measurable. Our soil is already so acidic anyway. Broadcast a little bit of ashes from your, you know, from your fireplace or lime, and you'll counteract the effects of the pine straw. Any other question? Yes? How long do the worms live in the How long do the worms live? Man, that's a great question. We've got so many worms, uh, you don't know which ones are new and which ones are old. <laughs> but they do reproduce, and you can see the little eggs. And especially when you're, doing the, um, when, you, when you're doing the harvesting of the compost, that's when you really start to see these things. You're digging through, and these little eggs, they look like these little seed capsules. And you'll see them. You'll see the little baby worms that are really kind of long, but they're like as thin as a hair. And then, of course, you've got the full-size ones. And I guess they're kind of dying in there as well, but you never see any dead worms, so I don't know. Anywhere from a week to a year, I don't know. Anything else? It doesn't look like it. All right. Y'all have been great. Thank you.